want to kick this off by welcoming all of you to the part two of the Empower Her Showcase series, The Art of Storytelling. Um, we have an amazing guest with us tonight, Christina Wilkinson, publisher of About Magazine, but we're going to give her a second um, to introduce herself here in a moment. Before we kick off the introductions, as we always do, I just want to let everybody know in the audience, um, if you didn't submit your piece ahead of time and you still would like to share with us tonight, just send a message to Kat or myself and we'll see what we can do to get you in. Um, so with that, I'm going to kick off the introductions. I am Alyssa Vasquez. I'm a national trainer and also the marketing strategist for Woven. I have been with the organization uh, since mid-2019 and I'm an Army veteran. With that, I'm going to kick it to Miss Kat. Hi, everybody. So nice to virtually see you guys. <laughs> My name is Kat Cortado. I am in Charlotte, North Carolina. I'm an Air Force veteran and I was one of the original peer leaders. So way back in 2017, I was one of the uh, six peer leaders that started all of this off. I'm also a uh, Woven's Community Relations and Partnerships Ambassador. And so before we get started, um, because we have such a superstar in our midst, I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, Christina Wilkinson. So Christina Wilkinson is a 10 year Air Force veteran who served in the Gulf War and she's also the daughter of a retired Army general. She has been a professional illustrator and has been in the publishing world for about 35 years total. Her personal clients have included celebrities such as Siegfried and Roy, David Cassidy of the Partridge family, the band Cake, Nancy Cartwright, the voice of Bart Simpson, by the way, Desi Arnaz Jr., and many more. She has also done work for NASA, Fisher Space Pens, HBO, ooh, that's interesting, the Mirage Hotel in Vegas, yeah, we got to talk about that, Christina, Death Valley <laughs> National Park, and too many more to list. Christina currently publishes a four-year-old magazine called Aval for women veterans by women veterans with Air Force veteran Sheila Holmes. She also co-publishes Women Veterans Magazine with Navy veteran Melissa Washington, who we all either know or have heard of. So Christina, welcome. And let's give her a warm applause, everybody. Are you just letting me go, Kat? Oh, go for it. It's, you got the floor, Christina. <laughs> okay, so basically, uh, yes, to add to what Kat just said about me, I'm a 10-year Air Force veteran. I was able to uh, serve during uh, the Gulf War, not in the Gulf War. I just want to correct that. Um, and uh, I was in a three years at George Air Force Base and uh, then seven years at uh, Moffett Field as an active guard reservist for the 129th Rescue Group. So I've gotten to be involved in a rescue unit for quite a long time, and I really enjoyed that aspect of my of my time in the military. Um, I also uh, did a lot in the military with publishing, uh, as well as before publishing, because my family comes from a newspaper background. So it was kind of a no-brainer to float into publishing in the military. Um, a lot of other people would know my job is a 702, which is an administrative assistant or a information management is what it was in. Yeah, you know what that is, right, Kat? Uh, so, but I ended up in the publications distribution office. I got to write and read and, and, and you know, author policies and tech orders and procedures and all that fun, boring stuff most people dislike. I really enjoyed that stuff. And uh, I didn't really do a lot of traveling during my time in the military. I, uh, I ended up, uh, I always say I went to Fresno. Uh, that's my private joke, but no, I got to go to Hawaii, got to go to Alaska, uh, got to go to Vancouver Island, which was probably my favorite deployment. And uh, that's pretty much for deployments for me. I really didn't do a whole lot as far as that was concerned. And uh, so when you're talking about a Val magazine, basically, uh, how a Val magazine got started is uh, Sheila Holmes is my uh, publishing editor. She basically said one day, you know what, we need a magazine for women because she got tired of looking at the American Legion magazines and all these other ones. And every time she would open it, there was a guy there, it was a dude. You couldn't open it and find a woman. You couldn't find anything representing women veterans. And, uh, you know, she kind of reached out to me and I kind of reached back and I said, you know what, we can make this work. 
And so we decided to kind of uh, uh, put it together. So Avow Magazine, first of all, it's a lifestyle magazine for, by, and about women veterans. Um, it gives insight to what it's like to live and walk in our shoes. And this is done through real life stories and articles. So when you're talking about, you know, stories and stuff, this is one of those magazines that does this. Uh, we do that in Avow Magazine. And I'm amazed at the women who will submit stories to us and articles about what they've gone through and being able to share their deepest, darkest, uh, I wouldn't call them secrets, but they are secrets. A lot of us have been through, uh, you know, MST. I'm a, I'm unfortunately one of those individuals. And it's one of the main reasons why I got out of the military. So it's great that women can feel trusted to publish their articles and, and their stories in our magazine to open up because I'll tell you what, anyone can pick up our magazine, anyone, and they can read about us and what it's like to be us. And there's still that personal thing, me personally as a publisher, wow, they trusted us to take care of their story for them and make sure that the world could see it. And this allows for our readers, you know, you guys, probably most everybody here on this, on this uh, event today, to be able to pick up that magazine and say, wow, I, I know what they feel like because I went through that same thing. And, and that's the biggest, biggest thing for us. Um, the good thing about it is, too, is that we don't always cover just the deep, dark, heavy stuff. We cover a lot of the uh, great stuff like entertainment. I mean, I can't even tell you how many women I have gotten to meet through Avow who are in the entertainment industry. Um, you know, I haven't met her yet, but Jennifer Marshall, uh, we actually just did a story on her in Women Veterans Magazine. That's the other magazine I co-publish. And Jennifer Marshall is, uh, she's one of the actresses on Stranger Things. And it's like, wow, I mean, how freaking cool is that? She served in the military and she's an actress and she's a famous actress. She's well known. Um, you know, and I look at some of these other women who are comedians and doing really, really well with that kind of thing. Um, I look at the people who are in agriculture, who are in uh, sports, uh, you know, and we all took different paths when we left our service behind us, but we didn't leave our service behind us. It'll always be there for us. And uh, the magazine is, is a huge boon for helping us realize that we can walk away from the service, but it doesn't walk away from us. And it, it's always going to be there. And the stories are, are proof of that. Um, so, I mean, one of the stories that I remember publishing Gosh, that was probably early on. It's called 17. And it was submitted by, of course, a woman veteran. And the name of the story, you're probably thinking 17 is probably how old she was when she joined the military. And that's actually not the case. Uh, 17, if you can find the story, leads into this is how many times he hit me before this happened. And it's a, it's, it's one of those trigger stories. We put trigger moments in our articles to make sure people know that that's going to happen. And then, like I said, there's also the lighthearted stuff. We featured the Olympic women on the shooting, uh, the shooting teams from last year. I was really fortunate because one of the women on the front cover of that issue happens to be a young lady who my daughter went to school with and was in the same shooting club with. And uh, she did not place in the Olympics, but she was on the Olympic team. And uh, we ended up having her, I think, four other of the women veterans on our front cover. Some of them were act, are still active duty, actually. So I need to clarify that. So we've been able to reach out to quite a bit of people just with what we've done with Avow Magazine. And uh, I've really enjoyed all the stories that we get and all of the articles that were, are coming out, uh, what we're doing. Um, one of our biggest issues was uh, we produced an article about Loretta. Loretta is the women uh, army soldier from the toy maker BMC and her name is Loretta she's on the front cover and we just put on the front cover finally we've got our little toy soldier that we can uh, play with and send our our youth you know to and that was a really cool thing so we had a um, I think it was Joanne a navy veteran She's the one who basically had approached the toy company to do the toys. And we wanted to make sure her story was out there because while 
was a seven-year-old girl who was getting the credit, it started with the Navy veteran. It, the little girl just happened to be that that got pushed over the edge and made it, you know, oh, how cute, a seven-year-old girl. But it was started by an actual woman veteran who got the ball rolling. And that was important for us to tell her story. So people knew that it wasn't just a seven-year-old girl who just all of a sudden decided, oh, I'm going to call this toy company and make them make the toys. It was a woman veteran who stepped up and got that ball rolling. And the little girl helped push that, you know, pushed it over the edge for us and got us those toys. So those are the stories we want to hear. We want to hear the ones about, okay, well, what got to us to that point? Um, we've had all kinds of really cool stories about women motorcycle clubs. A lot of women veterans out there driving bikes. Oh my gosh, it's crazy. Um, uh, you guys probably didn't know that or you did know that. It's, it's pretty cool. Uh, Sheila, the publishing editor, uh, she's one of those people. She's a badass. She rides a really nice bike and I think it's an Indian. Um, I don't know if she's on right now, but hi, Sheila, if you are. Uh, but it, it's really kind of neat that some of these things I would have never thought about. And wow, well, what, you know, boxers, women boxers uh, who are veterans who have been in the Olympics, you know, you add all of that on top of it. And it's just an amazing magazine to push forward our stories and, and elevate women veterans and make them see that we're human. We also have our lives, but we also have things that have happened to us that only we understand that nobody else does. And it lets them take a peek into that in a Val magazine. And uh, it, it is free to read online. So anybody can go read it, which is fantastic. Um, we've gotten nothing but positive reviews on it. And uh, I, I kind of wanted to add, I've mentioned the other magazine, also Women Veterans Magazine. Uh, and you're probably thinking, well, why do, would you have two women veterans magazines, right? It's really simple. Uh, the Women Veterans Magazine is a uh, state by state or regional ed edition type magazine, and it covers resources for veterans in general. So a guy could pick Women Veterans Magazine up and it would have resources for him about veteran service offices, about uh, state resources for veterans, about benefits for veterans for that state. Um, uh, cemeteries, homes, you know, uh, uh, just different kinds of things that have to do with veterans. So instead of being on the computer and you sitting here looking for everything, guess what? You pick up Women Veterans Magazine and it actually has everything in there for you. You're not trying to go find stuff you knew nothing about. It's all in there for you. And it gives phone numbers, it gives addresses, it gives people contact information. And we're publishing them, Melissa and I are publishing these magazines as annuals for each, most, most of the states. I won't say each, but most of them. We already released our California edition earlier this year. And um, we just, our Texas one just dropped this last week. So people who ordered it and have a subscription will be getting their issues in print. And uh, you can also purchase a copy of that online as well. So. Um, I'm real proud of the, of the work that I've been involved with in elevating women veteran in general. And, and I do have to say, I didn't have as many women veterans, fr veteran friends or military women friends as I do now in my life. And it took me probably over 20, 25 years to come out of my shell finally. And I'm, I'm really excited to be a part of working with Woven. And I, 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 I don't know, I've met so you and spoken to so many of you. It's just been a pleasure um, with all of you. All right, thank you so much for that. Um, okay, so I know you gave a very thorough, in-depth, you know, overview of yourself and the magazine, but we do have just a few more questions for you, if you wouldn't mind. Okay. I'll all right, so we've we got the link getting ready to go out for anybody that's interested um, in finding it online. But as far as actual content itself, do you have like a league of writers, or do you do you, are you mostly formed from writer submissions? From yeah, so so Sheila is a professional editor, and what we've done is we do not have a way. We don't have we're not a money maker, and that's the best thing to say about a vow. A vow is not a money maker, so we accept articles that are submitted to us. Uh, we go through and edit them and professionally do the layout, and that's kind of how it works. Uh, there's not much else we can do except for give credit to the authors 
they're usually all women veterans. There's been a, every once in a while where we've swapped that and allowed a male, a male writer to come in and do something, but that's an exception when we decide certain things need to be written about. All right, kick it over to Kat. <laughs> question, Christina, uh, just, just yes. listening to you. And, um, you know, first of all, you know, Melissa's awesome. But you know, thinking about all these magazines, I'm thinking we need a woman veterans television station. You're right. W You're right. W -E TV. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> but um, the question that I had is, um, how do you know if, if women have a woman veteran sees a vow and wants to submit a story how does she do that is there a process you go through to do that yeah so if you go to avowmagazine.com there is a uh a, a tab on the right hand upper right hand side in the menu and i believe it says submission and you could scroll down on that it says content submission information and it'll give you all the information about what we're looking for word count um, we do like to uh, host uh, up and coming businesses as well. And this is free. We don't charge people to, to put information out about their business even. So we like to highlight in a business spotlight for women veterans. So if you've got a business that you do that's aside from these national type chains, like we don't like to do like if you're doing Tupperware or Pampered Chef, but if you actually have a business that you started, we like to highlight you in the magazine as well. And all that information is right there. Um, I have another question, Alyssa, if you don't mind. No, go ahead. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, where do you see Avow Magazine in like five to 10 years? What is your goal for Avow? Our goal is to be out there as much as U.S. Veteran Magazine is. We want to be that high up. We want to have a magazine that uh, we don't, we don't want to rival U.S. Veteran Magazine. We want to be at that level with them. Mm -hmm. And ours is a completely different thing than theirs is, um, you know, and of course, everybody, most people know what U.S. Veteran Magazine is, and it's pretty big. But we do feel that there is a space that's that's been vacant for women veterans, and that's why a vow is here is to fill that spot. I love that. Alyssa, did you have a question? I did just out of curiosity. Now, I know you spoke about 17, um, so I don't know if that would be the one, but what is your favorite article, favorite piece, favorite thing that y'all have ever produced? You took my um, question. Oh, of I am so sorry. <laughs> and that's no, as far as I the came, came from Kat. <laughs> so that's as far as the stories themselves go. I'd say 17 was the one that hit me the hardest because, excuse me, I really shouldn't have said that. Um, uh, 17 is the one that uh, affected me the most. Uh, been through that, been there, done that. Um, I'm sorry, I did not mean to make that pun. I really apologize for those out there. Uh, that was an accident. So yes, that that would be my favorite and most emotional story I've ever done. And that was coming from that individual. And I just, uh, I don't believe I wrote the article myself. I believe it was submitted that way, but that was my favorite one. It was just raw. It was real. Yeah. Um, I've got one more question. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's a vow is for women, for women veterans, by women veterans. And um, I, I love that aspect, but do you ever get any comments or, you know, um, questions from men that are, who are veterans also, or maybe not, um, or just civilians in general who maybe saw it by accident because, you know, they know someone or their child is in the military and, 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 you know, is part of that. Do you ever get any questions or comments from civilians and or men? Okay. So as far as comments, we, um, we originally, when we started, we started getting negative comments, but they were from people who didn't really read the magazine. And so we did encourage them to read it and see what it was about, because of course we had some men coming out that were, it was a male basher magazine. And they didn't realize it wasn't about men. It was about us. It was a, it was, it was our magazine. It had nothing to do with men. And that was the huge difference. And so I think once the men started reading it, we did not get any pushback at all from men negatively. And we do have a lot of male supporters on our Facebook page. They go in and 
you post something and they're like, they share it with whoever else they share it with. And it's just amazing to see the support we're getting from, uh, from these men. And I don't know if they're veterans or not, but they're men and they do share it and they are very supportive. So, so they are out there and uh, uh, we get them from uh, relatives too. Like some people, oh, I've got a, a daughter who just got in the military, but I see where your stories are really helpful. So they will go in and they'll you know, send the link to them or, uh, or get a printed subscription. And, um, and I am saying printed subscription because we do have a current printed subscription that we're working on for people who have subscribed for uh, one year. Uh, but there's a lot of things going on with COVID that has increased prices. So we've actually kind of halted printing subscriptions right now. So you won't be able to get those. I just want to clarify that, but you can still read the magazine for free online. Awesome. Thank you, Christina. Uh, for anyone listening, if you have any questions for Christina, you can put them in the Q and A box, but I'm going to pass it back to Alyssa. Yeah, and I just want to say that we do already have, it's not a question, but we have a comment. Uh, we have one reader that has seen your magazine and they just want to let you know that they love the magazine. So, Oh, well, thank Stephanie you so Liddell. much. That makes me feel good. Thank you. Me too. That's two. <laughs> oh, well, you've been in it. I think you've been in it, Kat, have, haven't you? I have. Yes, <laughs> I did. <laughs> so I remember I absolutely seeing you. love it. <laughs> yeah, I think you were on a two-page spread even with Tracy. Yeah. Yes, I do. I remember that. Yeah. I love the magazine. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. That, Good. That is awesome. Okay. And I, I was going to ask the question, but you, you already did partially answer it about the, the hard copies. Cause I'm one of those old people that I hate reading digital stuff. So, uh, <laughs> do you have like an expected time frame for when you guys would be able to start the printing? We're, we're kind of holding off for about, uh, we've got two more that we're printing that we're not taking subscriptions for. We might have extras, but um, I think we're going to hold off for another two issues after that just to see what happens. Um, because to kind of give you a good idea is printing prices have doubled since last year. And printing is not cheap. So you're looking at thousands of dollars. So it's one of those things that we've not taken, you know, it's hard to do it because it's hard not to do it because we've been doing printing now, but we have to also consider the monetary stuff that's coming. It's just very difficult. So. And I feel your pain. I had to order a bunch of marketing collaterals and the, uh, the it totally doubled from the last time we had to order. <laughs> yes, so. it did. Yeah. <laughs> Um, all right. So uh, Kat, what do you think? Do you want to, we want to open it up to the sharers. We've got a couple that are, that are here and would like to share their pieces. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do right. it. Who do we want to call up first? I think we will go with Sheila Walker. All right, Sheila. All right. Just start. We want to introduce yourself first. We'd love to hear about <laughs> you. I know. I'm so sorry. Um, my name is Sheila Walker. I'm Army veteran. Uh, I left, I had about three years back in the 80s, so I'm uh, dating myself um, and actually retired a few years ago from federal government. Um, I did not name the piece that I'm going to read, so I'll just start to read it now. I'm sitting on a bench waiting for the bus, already 12 minutes late. I glare at the shiny red sports car parked illegally in the bus stop zone because it reminds me of my ex's car. I get up, go over, kick the tire. The owner arrives in time to see me do it, calls me a name that my mama would have slapped him for and threatens to call the police. I sink back to the bench, thoroughly chastened. The new girlfriend posted a picture of them leaning on his car to let me know I'd been replaced. I'd helped him buy that damn car. When I saw her post, I wanted to slap the extensions out of hair and dent that perfect little nose of hers. I was out the door when I realized that I wouldn't look so good in a wanted poster donning a stained sweatshirt and hair that hadn't seen a comb that day. So I went back to bed with Ben and Jerry. When I was a little girl back in the Stone Age, we went to Myrtle Beach. I loved it. Blue water, gentle waves, the loud call of seagulls, 
I fed the birds and hunted seashells. I gave mama the small, delicate ones. She put them in a pot with the fern daddy bought her the first year we visited. I smelled it because it was pretty. It smelled green to me. Last year, accidentally, I accidentally dropped it when I helped mama move to the existent living place. She cried in the bathroom. I wouldn't have dropped it if I just moved in when she asked me to. Constant disappointments. I wish with all my soul to be anywhere away from here. My regret tastes like bitter lemons in my mouth. Thank you very much for that share. Let's give it up for Sheila, the first one. Yay. <laughs> All right, we will just wait for Christina to rejoin us here. That was really heartfelt, Sheila. Yes, you know, I, I yes, really it was very nice. Your pain, you know, the discomfort that you had. So thank you. And the, your descriptive language, it just really helps paint just this awesome picture. Mm -hmm. Christina, do you have any questions for Ms. Sheila? Anything you'd like to know? Or? Um, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. Uh, no, it's beautiful, beautiful writing and everything, or beautiful reading at this point. Um, I didn't catch what military branch you were in. Army. You were Army? Well, we won't hold that against you. That'd be kind. I got your back, Sheila. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> no, but really beautiful. Thank you for sharing with us. Thank you for letting me share. Sheila, I just wanted to say that that sounds like part of a chapter out of a book. Actually, it isn't. Remember, we had two challenges last week. We could do uh, 300 words from a timeline or do 300 words from like seven things that we were supposed to blend into that story. And that's kind of what happened. I know, I'm, I'm saying that you should be writing a book, Sheila. That should be hint, part hint. of the book. But stop. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Well, actually, um, I was in a writing workshop at the Washington DC VA after I retired. Um, our group has been disbanded now. But what we did was we were there for like a couple of years and we uh, compiled all our work and we self-published. Wow. That is awesome. So you're a published artist. Yeah, that's a, author, that's a tough thing. It's easier to do now. I'm sorry. It's easier to do now, but it still is a real difficult thing to do in general. It, it can be, uh, it took a lot of time with the editing and the, you know, set up it, it was uh not an easy um process but we had two veteran uh po authors and uh they did a lot of the behind work for us so that was uh, a good thing yeah well, like that so much, fan Sheila. keep it going because you and there was a couple of like that guy with the red car i wanted to fight him and i'm sure cat did too <laughs> <laughs> you got a like, gift hey <laughs> <laughs> wow. Thank you. Can we, can we give Sheila a round of applause, please? Yes. Yay. Thank you so much, Sheila. That was awesome. So, who's our next person? All right. And we have. I think it's Karen. Yes. Karen. Hi, Karen. Hi, everyone. <laughs> I know <Hello>. you. <laughs> I know you. <laughs> You know me. <laughs> um, hi. So uh, I'm Karen, like uh, everybody said. Um, I'm actually a woven trainer. And uh, I've been uh, with woven since 2019, late 2019. Um, and you'll get my branch of Navy from the name of my story. And I only have a what was it, 300 word teaser, all right? So, I mean, I've written the whole story, but I was told I'm only giving my 300 words, so here you go. 
All right. Mine is called uh, the Real Navy. All right. Like all of us who served in the military, my naval career began with boot camp. It was followed by 16 months of advanced electronics training where I was often reminded that this was not the real Navy. I thought it was a way for the instructors and the staff to remind us that we were still in training, but then I heard it from other, other sailors at my first duty station. This duty station was a communication center uh, named Harold E. Hope and it was located um, in the outback of Australia. This was my sea duty and we had a very important mission for the time, so I couldn't understand it. I thought I joined the real Navy. Navy. Why wasn't this duty station the real Navy? My next duty sa station was shore duty in Hawaii. This of course couldn't be the real Navy. It was not sea duty for sure. And it was not sea duty. <laughs> After my three year tour in Hawaii, I finally received orders to a ship. Yes, a ship. I would finally find this elusive real Navy. When I arrived, I soon discovered that this ship was not part of the real Navy either. My ship was a tender, a non combatant ship, and therefore was not was not to be considered to be was not considered to be in the real navy either i finally picked up on the reality that the real navy could only be found on a combatant ship if this was true how was i going to find it it was the late 80s and by law women weren't allowed on this type of ship i didn't understand why you could you could only find it there just because the ship was not a combatant we made six two month deployments in a three year period. I really thought I had found it. Ta-da, 300 words. <laughs> yeah. Hey. So Karen, did you, your vision of what the Navy is and what the Navy actually was were two different things. Is that what you're trying to tell us? <laughs> no, I'm trying to tell you that uh, I wasn't in the real Navy. You know, the real Navy <laughs> for me couldn't be found because, you know, I'm a girl. Yeah. Oh, that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but it has a happy ending. I did find it eventually, uh, but it's in my story. <laughs> I love that. How did, what inspired you to write about that out of all the things? Did it just come to you easily? Like, what was your, so I'm gonna ask you this, I'm gonna put you on the spot, Karen. What was your process for writing this 300 word essay? Did it just well, come to you or did you just sit down and write it? Uh, well, uh, no, I, I actually did what um, Tracy said is I, I, I actually built a timeline and uh, I thought of uh, different things and I was actually writing a, a different piece, right? That I was putting my thoughts down. And then as I was writing that, I'm like, it connected me to this. So then I changed directions and I started writing this piece and it wrote real easy. Once I, once I had it, my thought and knew, like my beginning, middle and end, it was easy to put out in words or, you know, wasn't easy but you know what i mean and it's not perfect because of course i did it in a what uh day you know <laughs> well two days i had to think about it and and then once i thought about it like i said it came to me <laughs> well thank you karen for sharing that i i appreciate you participating um is there anyone else that maybe was kind of hesitant to share that maybe wants to come up and share? We are going to read Angela's piece here in a little bit, but Karen, I just want to tell you, I love your writing because it so matches your personality, like that little <laughs> subtle humor. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> I do have the rest of it if anybody ever wants to hear it. <laughs> I mean, we would love to hear it now if you 
Just know that the offer is on the table. The offer is on the table if you would like to share it now. It is enough time? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, I'll share it then. All right. Let me find my spot in this other. I put it in big print on the other one. <laughs> I'm so excited. <Sorry. laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. All right. All right. All right. So where were we? Um, but a uh, little, little, I thought I had really found it. I, it, I mean, I was on a ship, not a was in, in Australia or in a, or on an island like Hawaii. Um, wait a minute. Uh, hold on a second. Uh, oh, there it is. Sorry. Oh yeah, yeah, that was, I was right. Okay. I didn't understand this either because this ship was not a combat. We made two six month deployments in a three month period. I thought I had really found it. Um, I was on a ship, not overseas in Australia or on an island like Hawaii. Finding this elusive Navy became a mission of mine. Luckily in 1994, combatant ships were open to females. The number of ships were limited though. The ship had to be retro retrofitted for females first and this was not a quick, quick process for the government. In 1995, I became among the first wave of women on combatant ships. I was finally going to find the real Navy. I was beyond excited. It only took me 10 years to get there. I checked on board, then I waited and I waited, but nothing happened. This ship was doing the same things as my last ship. We were getting underway, we were deploying, we were conducting drills, fixing equipment, ordering parts, completing PMS and standing watches. It was all the same things as we had done at my previous commands, just a new environment. I went on to complete that tour. I made chief that I went back overseas and I was still looking for the real Navy. Then one day it happened. I was sitting in the Navy exchange cafeteria eating a little breakfast before I went back to the ship. I had a, a lot on my mind. My 40th birthday was in two days and the ship, ship's deployment was next week. I was also thinking about the repairs that we still needed to make before we left. I was really looking forward to this cruise. It was going to be my first deployment to the Med. I had already completed two Westpacs and I was excited about visiting the ports on that side of the water, places like Greece, Spain, and Italy. I ran the electronics division on board, which included all the internal and exterior communications, such as phones, internets, radios, and radars. It was my first deployment as a chief, so I was doubly worried that I got it right. I was thinking about the contract, contractors finishing the installation of our satellite TV system, which would give the crew live TV for the first time while out to sea. When I paused to think, I glanced up to one of the TVs hanging high on one of the walls and thought I saw a live report. Heck, heck ugh, sorry, I thought I saw a live report. I saw smoke billowing across the clear blue sky. The food court was mostly empty since it was just 15 minutes after 9 a.m. and the stores had just opened. What I was witnessing when I looked up was the first live coverage after the second plane hit the Twin Towers. I moved closer, my eyes glued to the TV, trying to hear the details. It was chaos on the TV. I had to leave. I had to get back to the ship as soon as I possible. I quickly cleaned up my mess and headed for the door. As I was going through the gate of the base, it was eerily quiet. There are no cars in front of me and no cars behind me. The gate guard was a young seaman and he was checking my ID. I could hear the quiver of his voice as he told me about the plane that had just hit the Pentagon. As I drove to Chief's parking, to Chief's parking I was becoming extremely worried. We were stationed on the largest naval base on the East Coast. Could we be next? Who was to blame? If we aren't next, 
then who, who is? I quickened my step. The walk down the pier seemed normal. I saw stores being unloaded from the various trucks. There were cranes going up and down, and there were sailors and contract tractors walking to and from the ship. As I was climbing the brow of the ship, I also noticed that some of the crew was offloading mattresses. We are all getting new, new ones for the deployment. I reached the quarter deck, turned to the flag at the back of the ship, saluted, then requested permission to come aboard. I learned that the executive officer was about to announce that we were having an all hands call on the flight deck with the skipper in just a few minutes. As the crew headed to the flight deck, you could feel the uncertainty, the worry. The skipper told us that we may have to get underway in a few hours and to plan accordingly. If needed, we would be heading to New York Harbor. We were going to protect our country from further terrorist attack. We did find out what happened by then. As you might imagine, getting a ship underway is no easy task. Everything must be checked from engines to radars, radios, and most of all, at least for this underway, we wanted to check our weapon systems. The 96 hour underway check office was going to have to be completed in record time if we were going to get underway in a few hours. We had to be ready when the call came. To make matters wor worse, much of the crew was off the ship taking care of last minute personal and official matters. Some of the crew was still on leave. I was missing my boss, the, elect, the EMO, and all my sailors that ran the phone and television systems on board. They were off buying new television for the crew's birthing. I really needed them back. Everyone has a job to do. We had heard that it was now taking hours to get on base. We were on high alert. The base and all the ships were in terrorist threat uh, condition, ThreatCon Delta. The ThreatCon system outlines the security measures to be taken by U.S. military facilities and personnel when threatened by a terrorist attack. In ThreatCon Delta, no one except for essential personnel are allowed on base and all and IDs are scrutinized like you are entering Fort Knox. We are on the largest naval base on the East Coast, a definite target. We got the word. We are we're to head to New York immediately. We lifted the brow before the sun even set. We had a job to do. Calls to loved ones had been made. Child care had been arranged. No one expected to get underway that day, and some of the crew had not brought their clothes to the ship for the upcoming deployment leaving them without clothes, soap, and shampoo, and even shower shoes, yet no one complained. It was utterly amazing what happened that day. I watched our sailors come together, E1 through E9s, working together to, call, to haul over 300 mat mattresses back up to the ship, then through the ship to each of the berthings. They worked together to upload milk and other food items that were still on the pier. Others were working together to bring the ship alive. It was a sight to see. It was like witnessing one of those fast forwarding baking videos you see on Facebook that produced the most awesome cakes. After the brow was lifted, the phones were tested and the circuits were brought online. I went to catch a breath and smoke a cigarette. As I was watching a slip out to sea, I was thinking back on the day. What I witnessed from the crew that day was the real Navy. But what I also, what I also realized that day was that I had been witnessing the real Navy every single day of my last 16 years. I realized that the real Navy was not a place at all. It was a spirit. It is that can-do spirit I witnessed not only that day, but I witnessed every day, day in and day out. It did not matter if I was stationed overseas, stateside, or on a ship. Sailors make things happen, anything to get the job done. We may gripe while doing it, but as part of who we are, it's like the saying goes, a happy sailor is a bitchin' sailor. It is the spirit. 
The spirit doesn't care if you are an officer enlisted, a man or a woman. We all get it. The spirit is, is the honor, the courage, and the commitment we witness every day. Every branch of service has a spirit. That spirit never leaves us. It's what spawns us for life. It is why we will never forget. Hashtag never forget. That was awesome. awesome. That, was, that was fantastic. Yes, it was. Thank you so <laughs> much for sharing that. <laughs> that Karen, Karen, yours and Sheila's uh, stories are things that we definitely would like to publish in our magazine. So you should consider submitting, really. I mean, that was just a beautiful, beautiful story. Love that. I think we have two other people that stepped up and wanted. I think Peggy wanted to come up. Thank you, Karen. That was amazing. You're that was awesome, good. Karen. Thank you. Hi, Peggy. Hi, Kat. <clears throat> Hi, how are you? Good. How are you doing? I'm good. It's good to see you. You as well. And uh, I just wanted to say that um, Christina, Karen, myself, we're all women who served back in the eighties and, you know, afterwards. Um, so that's the common theme, I think, for tonight so mm -hmm. far. <clears throat> I'm an army veteran and uh, hopefully you'll get a few chuckles out of my story because it's meant to be funny, but it's a true story. Um, let's see. And there's a significant backstory, which I, couldn't um, write about to stick to the 300 words. So I had to kind of jump ahead, um, but it doesn't affect the story. In 1984, a man from Dakowitz, which is the Defense Advisory Committee on Women in the Services, visited Fort Leonard Wood. Oh, wait a minute, that's, sorry, that is the backstory. <laughs> so I'll, I'll skip that. Um, while participating in a training exercise at the National Training Center, otherwise called NTC, at Fort Irwin, California, in the early 80s, as the only female engineering officer, I did my best to get up before sunrise, sleeping in my sleeping bag on the desert away from the men and the large equipment so as not to be run over at night if they move that piece of equipment. I walk with my e-tool and trenching tool, little shovel, to the backside um, and military crest of the nearest dune for a bit of privacy. There's no trees in the desert. I dig my hole and answer mother nature's call. One morning, I heard the sound of helicopter blades, whop, 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 and the sound got louder. So I crouched lower to the ground and tucked my head, praying no one above would see me, thinking, okay, I'm wearing camos, I should be good to go. I crouched lower to the ground, uh, sorry. <clears throat> Damn it, why did they have to fly so close to me? where I was at this particular moment in time and this particular place in the big desert. I was wearing camos. I should blend in. Maybe they won't see me. I couldn't move and didn't move. The day seemed like the others, so I thought I made it. Phew. That evening at the CO's tent, he passed out sodas to his LTs and began the nightly brief reviewing how we did that day and what tomorrow's mission was. Of course, the preview of weather was always part of his brief. I remember him talking about a unique moonrise that morning and he looked towards me with a straight face and then wham, someone else broke a smile and I knew the pilots had seen me. They'd ID'd me and told the CO via the radio what or whom had been witnessed. I was so embarrassed 
And yet, so went the social experiment with placing women in combat heavy engineering units, SAONs, which is the engineer logo. Let us try. I was trying. That's my story. <laughs> wow. Yeah. You never think about stuff like that, Peggy, you know? <laughs> I, I, real, I mean, seriously, that's, wow. Thank you for sharing that. Yes. Yeah, I've heard, uh, heard a lot of stories about women, you know, just taking care of themselves, regular things that we need to do. And, you know. You know. I love yeah, it. That, that's a chore. That that's a heavy lift right there. Yeah, it yeah. is. <laughs> wow. And even though you let off talking about like, you know, the generational thing, like it every single female veteran can connect with some part of your story. Like yes. Awesome job. Yeah, yeah but but you but you know what? You're like a leader really if you think about it. Cause I mean I got in in 1983, 84. And so I think we're around the same time period. And you look back at what you had to go through and you were a a, a way a, a pay you know you paved the way for other women mm -hmm. to come in behind you especially with the type of job that you did thank you <clears throat> i i think the word might be trailblazer mm -hmm. that's what it is yeah <laughs> yeah my I'm mind's not saying. thinking right now <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly what she is <clears throat> thank a you Peggy. Sure. <laughs> thanks for listening absolutely thanks so much and who do we have next? Is it Jen? Is yes, ma'am. There she is. Hey, ladies. I know you. <laughs> <laughs> it's our favorite Jen. <laughs> well, for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is, is Jen Sapone. I am a woven trainer, uh, Army, Army veteran. I've been with Woven since the beginning of 2020. Wow. So, yes. So exciting stuff. And I'm one of the old people too. So you get another one. <laughs> Go old people. Go old people. <laughs> We're just seasoned very well. I like the word season. I'm a seasoned veteran too. So just saying. Yeah. Yes. Yes. We ready? Let's do it. All right. Let's see how this goes. But mom, I don't want to. Jennifer Ann, you are 17 years old. At some point in your life, you are going to have to learn how to pick up the phone and call for pizza. Now this was a typical conversation in the Sapone household during my high school years. As I looked to graduate in June of 1986, I was also looking to head to Army basic training. I was a very quiet, very, very shy country girl who would get anxiety when I had to pick up the phone that was attached to the wall and call for pizza. Flash forward to the summer of 1987, you found me at Fort Lee, Virginia for advanced individual training for supply. I stood in formation that very hot July day in the last row. It might be hard to see on Zoom, however, I'm short. I'm really short. I was not that much taller than either. To this day, I am unsure how Drill Sergeant Robertson saw my hand when he asked who was a private first class. He did though. He called me forward to be a squad leader. That marked my first foray into leadership. Now at that time, Jerry Lewis Labor Day marathons were a thing. Every fall you would see the TV taken up with Jerry Lewis calling for donations for muscular dystrophy. All those kids that he supported were called Jerry's kids. So every morning as we stood in formation and we waited for Jill Sergeant Robertson to call out for sick call, he would stand there and say, Jerry's kids fall out. And they would fall out and limp and crutch over to the bus. One morning, he did it, he stood up in the row and said, Jerry's kids, fall out. The whole platoon in unison took one step back. We turned and took off for the bus. You could hear him laughing as he said, get your butts back here, you fools. 
Flash forward to September 12th, 2022. We dropped my daughter, Jessie, off, 20 years old, to fly out for Army basic training. I'm not sure if it's better or worse that I have prior knowledge of what she might be going through. The day before she left, she was searching for my dog tags. Why are you looking for those now, Jesse? <clears throat> well, mom, I want one because when things get hard, I can pull them out and remember if you did it, so could I. Oh, what? I love that. So sweet. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Wow. I love that. Oh, that is so cool. Oh man. Oh, and you hooked us right from the beginning. Oh, you got a gift. I know. I was yeah. like, we had to lean in. We were right? like, <laughs> what's she about to tell us? <laughs> I'm like, what? what? Wow. Wait. Let me see. Lots Let me of listen. great, great stories. <laughs> Lots Thank of them. you. That would be another one for a vow. Wow. There you, you go, Jan. There you go. I'll definitely well, hit you up, Christina. Thank you. Military mama, she can do it all. <laughs> right? <laughs> I'll yes. tell you, ladies, it's been a harder week than I thought it would be. <laughs> I bet. Yeah. yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> well, Nobody gets Alyssa, you ready for that one. <laughs> Alyssa, do you want to close this out? Yeah, um, so I just want to double check. I think we might have Angela. Do we have one more? I think we do have just the one more. Angela. Yeah. There's Angela. <laughs> Hi. Welcome. Hi. Uh, okay. I'd like to introduce yourself first before you share. Um, yeah, Angela Miller. I'm an Army veteran. And I'm in Florida. Um, in Pensacola, near the Pensacola area. And so my short story is a little more personable instead of including the military, though it does have some military factors in it. So do you want me to just begin reading? Sure. Okay. Go for it. All right, thank you. Historically, Pennsylvania was founded by William Penn, a Quaker who loathed religious persecution so much that he created a society where occupants would could worship freely. A colony based on respect. The city of brotherly love was established for Europeans and Africans who reverently and supportively resided together. My teenage Catholic mother and her younger Jewish acquaintance met in 1963 at Cooper's small neighborhood store in a Jewish populated neighborhood in a Jewish neighborhood located near Broad Street, a historic road in a uh, neighborhood planned for multiple small shops, churches, synagogues and museums intertwined amongst attached and throughout uh, throughout through fairs of row houses. Mother's adult intent was never to remain in Philadelphia, but rather to return to the Canary Islands, the Latin Haven where she was born and longed to be permanently. Canary Islands, historically a Caribbean bridge that intertwined the continents of Africa, Europe to North America and South America. Mother of pre-tween followed her foreign mother to North America to Pennsylvania. And like a baby sandpiper bird who ventures from a nest to experience the ocean shores, mother could not have foreseen the hardships forced upon her, nor could she imagine the storms that she would endure. After several dates and a fall carnival, her Jewish acquaintance learned she was pregnant. Father, a 16-year-old boarding school graduate, desperately gathered money for an illegal abortion. Until 1967, many unwanted pregnancy procedures were completed in Jewish back alley offices. The Roe versus Wade Abortion Act had not yet been passed. Mother took the medical funds to secure an apartment for herself while settling into the new roles as a switchboard operator and mother-to-be. A neighborhood party resulted in her meeting several residents and a Navy sailor, Pig, an American Indian turned Navy sailor recently returned from Vietnam. Pig was a tall, bronze-skinned, handsome man with broad shoulders, thick black hair, and a smooth talker. Since I was too young to remember anything about Philadelphia, my childhood memories began in Indiana in a white duplex house in a middle class, middle of a working class, multiracial neighborhood. Wow. Now, now there's more to it. I didn't want to go over the 300 words. 
That so, sounds like a book too. That sounds like yeah. an autobiography. It is. Yeah, it does. So I have like three little paragraphs that will help um, close it out. I think we got time for those three paragraphs. Okay, thank yeah. you. <laughs> Sadly, I do not remember one happy exchange between my parents when I was a child. Big was a controlling, loud, politically ignorant, socially unkept alcoholic. And my mother was a beautiful Spanish woman who was soft-spoken, well-kept, and fashionable. She always looked much younger than her factual age. With each argument or drunken binge, my mother experienced hands-on lessons often, often observed by her children. Beaten into submissiveness, my mother went to great lengths to hide her pain and to shelter her children from abuse and maintain the false resemblance of the picket fence family. Big openly favored my sister. She was a pretty caramel uh, complexion and beautifully chiseled ethnic features. And still today, my sister is exotically beautiful, very loving and very kind. My brother and I were often neglected and ignored by Pig as children. Moreover, if we did, were not ignored, we were hit or blamed for anything, everything. While my brother fought for his father's love and attention, I didn't. I loathed it. I was not fond of it at all. Powerful. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Oh very I, personal, too. I mean, yeah. thank you for sharing that. Yeah, message. that's extremely. That's very powerful. And you definitely took us for a turn talking about the beautiful Spanish woman and then, <laughs> woo! <laughs> I was not ready, but you, 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 and you're a creative writer too. From the that first chunk that you that you read. Oh, good. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yes. I could see publishing all of these stories in a Val magazine that right? we heard today. They're just amazing. Yeah. Wow. Dang, a lot of life so. lessons. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, a lot of life are, lessons. Lots of them. Mm -hmm. uh, well, and the language that you use is so descriptive and intertwining and all that stuff. So. <laughs> <laughs> I will publish it. <laughs> thank you, Angela. Yes, that thank you so much. Fantastic. Thank you. And for all, can we just give a round of applause for all the people that were brave enough to come up and share their their, their stories? I think that's yes. awesome. Yes. Standing ovation. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, Stephanie's hitting us with the good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> All right. On that note, we are going to thank everyone so much for joining us tonight. This was such an awesome event. Um, yes. You can look for the event in our in our newsletter tomorrow. We're going to go ahead and make sure y'all have links. Um, directly to a vow if you need them. And then also we'll be linking y'all with Tracy Crow and Mill Speak from the first part of this two-part series. Um, so with that, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Christina. You are an awesome addition and highlight of this event. And I'm going to pass it over to Kat for any final words. I just, you know, this was awesome. I'm, I'm leaving this on such a high note. Um, you guys, you women are from phenomenal, but you already know that you're women veterans. So I don't even have to say that. Um, but thank you to my cohort, Alyssa Vasquez and Christina for her time today. And for anyone else who is in the audience, thank you. Thank you so much for being a part of this. This was huge for us. You guys showed up and we love y'all. So good night for now, but stay tuned for some other stuff that's coming up. Oh well, yeah. Right. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Christina. Have a good evening. Thank you too. Bye. Have a good have a good evening. Bye bye. Bye, Lisa. See ya.